Greetings and blessings um, to you all. Thank you for watching this video. And thank you for taking the time. I pray that this word will bless you. I pray that this word will sink deep into your heart and take root in your heart. That it will grow up and bear fruit the full 100 fold in your lives. In Jesus name. Uh, today I'm going to share a message on the new temple. The new temple. This is something God has put on my heart. Um, and I believe it's important for us to know um, what it means for us to be the new temple of God. There's a lot um, for us to step into and to experience um, that God wants to do in us and through us when we get this revelation. Um, so yes, we all know the scripture out of 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 1 Corinthians 3 16 that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what does that really mean for us? So I'm going to go into that a little bit. Um, before we get to the new temple, let's talk a bit about the old temple. So the old temple, like with everything else in the old covenant, was types and shadows pointing towards the new. It was the old physical that pointed towards the new spiritual in Christ Jesus. Um, so back in the old days, it was about the physical temple building. Um, and that was that was something that um, that the Jews of those days were very proud of, um, and they went there to make sacrifices. They went there to worship. They went there to to pray. They went there to experience the presence of God in the physical temple. Um, but like I say, these were types and shadows of what was to come in Christ. Um, and if we think about the the um, the physical temple back in those days. Uh, in terms of the actual building, there was the outer court, there was the inner court, which was also called the holy place, and then there was the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is the place where the priest would go in once a year with the blood of goats and bulls, and he would go and present um, the blood upon the mercy seat um, on behalf of the people for their sins. But we know, like Hebrews tells us, that that blood was never able to take away the sins of the people. In fact, all it did was remind people of their sins year upon year. They were still under the law. They didn't have grace yet. They didn't have the uh, price paid for them yet. Um, but these sacrifices only made them feel worse because they they were alerted or attention was drawn to their sins through offering these sacrifices. But in Christ Jesus, as we know, the price was then paid once for all. The blood of Jesus completely set us free. The law was fulfilled. Our sins were forgiven past, present, and future through his one sacrifice. And that blood was able to take away and wash away and remove all of our sins from us. Hallelujah. That is good news. Um, so I want to read and I want to show you something out of Act 6, um, which is very important for us to grasp this. Because Stephen, this is now leading up to Stephen stoning in Acts chapter 7. And what I want to show you is I want to show you the main reason, the essence of why they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So let's read um, in Acts 6 from verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freed men, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him up to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. You see there, the reason why they're accusing him is because they, they accused him of speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. What is this holy place? The temple of Jerusalem. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will, of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Okay, let's hop across to the next chapter, Act 7. Stephen then stands up and he then addresses the Sanhedrin, the council. And what he talks about is he talks about the call of Abraham. He talks about the patriarchs in Egypt um, and then about how God delivers Israel by Moses. 
Then he talks about Israel rebelling against God. And then he talks about, from verse 44, God's true tabernacle. So Acts 7 verse 44, I'll pick it up there again. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. This is important, verse 48. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Okay, so you can see from those scriptures that the essence of why they stoned Stephen is because he spoke against their temple, he spoke against their man-made tabernacle, um, and he was talking about how the Most High does not desire to dwell in temples made with hands. And that was when Stephen got stoned, and then the 490 years of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 was completed then. I will teach on that in a separate teaching, but the last week of years began when Jesus was baptized, um, and his and his ministry began. Um, Daniel then prophesies in Daniel 9, and he says, in the middle of the last week of years, the Messiah will be cut off. And that's exactly what happened. He was crucified in the middle of that last week of years, in the middle of the last seven years, uh, three and a half years in. And then three and a half years from the crucifixion of Jesus was the stoning of Stephen that I've just read to you now. So that was the end of the last week of Daniel's years, or of, of Daniel's prophecy, the end of the 490 years. That last seven years is not a future tribulation to come. We cannot place 2,000 years uh, as, as a gap between the 69 week of years and the 70th week of years. It followed on consecutively from there. Um, and then what happened after this? Great persecution arose after Stephen stoning. Um, and that is when God's people were scattered and they went out to all of the nations and they took the gospel not just to the Jews, but also out to the Gentiles. Um, but like I said, that's something that I will teach on. That's a bit of a side note. Okay, um, let's touch quickly on, let's go to Matthew 24 from here. Matthew 24 is quite a controversial chapter at the moment with all that is happening at the moment in the world, um, and many people have opinions on this, um, but I will teach also on Matthew 24 and just go into that a little bit for you. Uh, Matthew 24 predicts the destruction of Jerusalem and destruction of the temple, um, and everything that Jesus prophesies in Matthew 24 was completely and entirely fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. It is not something to come in the future. It is something that was completely fulfilled. Um, but like I say, I will teach on that separate to this message. So Matthew 24 verse 1, let's, let's go there. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. So they were very proud and they were boasting and they, were, they wanted to show him how awesome their, their temple was. Verse 2, And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
Okay, again, he's talking about the destruction of the temple, and that was exactly what happened in AD 70, 40 years after this prediction that Jesus gave, one generation. Okay, um, next I want to take you into Jeremiah 3. If you can again just go with me to Jeremiah 3. Um, this is just a little bit more on what we are speaking about. So Jeremiah 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the Amplified version. I think the Amplified just says this nicely. So Jeremiah 3, and we're going to read from verse 15. Jeremiah 3.15 in the Amplified reads, And I will give you spiritual shepherds after my own heart in the final time, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding and judgment. And it shall be that when you have multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they seriously remember it, nor shall they miss or visit it, nor shall it be repaired or made again. For instead of the ark, this is important, for instead of the ark which represented God's presence, he will show himself to be present throughout the city. So as I've said now, the old were types and shadows pointing towards the new. Um, that ark was the old, um, but, they will, but we will not speak about the old anymore. It only represented God's presence, but in the new, he himself will show himself to be present throughout the city. And that city is God's people. That is Zion. That is you and me. Amen. Um, okay, let's go now. We're going to go to John 14. There's just a couple more scriptures I'm going to go to. Um, so if you can just bear with me there. John chapter 14. Let's go back to New King James Version. Um, we'll go to New King James. John chapter 14. I want to read from verse 17 for you. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, he dwells with you, and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me, will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home with him. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, as we know, verse 26 and 27 says, The mystery which was hidden throughout the ages has now been revealed. And what is that mystery? That is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So now you'll see I've shifted away from the old, which represented the new, and I'm shifting now to the new, which is which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Um, Philemon 6, second last scripture. Philemon 6, not a very well-known book. There is only one chapter in Philemon. Um, so Philemon 6 says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that shows you that it is important for us to acknowledge what is in us and to get the revelation of Christ in us. Because as we do that, then the sharing of our faith becomes more effective. So God is able to manifest more and more through us as we grow in the knowledge of who is inside of us. As we grow in the knowledge that God himself dwells inside of us in all of his glory and all of his power. Amen to that. So John 2 last scripture I want to go to today is in John 2. And we're going to go, I believe it's verse 19. Um, 
Let's start in verse 18. So it's talking about, this is when Jesus cleanses the temple. Um, I want to start in verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple. Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Okay, he was speaking of the temple of his body. Who is now the body of Christ? It is not any physical building. It is you and me. We are now the body of Christ, and he is the head. So in three days he rose it up, he paid, he paid the price, he went to the cross. On the third day he rose again, the Holy Spirit was poured out. We are now that body, we are now his body. And um, I want to now just get to the, to the real crux of the message here that I want to share today. And that is, um, in John 14, Jesus says, The works that I do, you will also do, and even greater works you will do because I go to the Father. So I want to just bring this forward across in this message, and I hope that this that this resonates with you and that you can grasp this revelation. But I believe that Jesus is talking there not just about the actual physical miracles. I know that we, we talk about that scripture and we say the works that he does, we will do an even greater. And I think sometimes what we think about is, God will do through us even more and more amazing miracles, types of miracles. I'm not saying that God will not do that. Of course, God can do anything. We don't want to limit him and we are vessels for him to flow through and we are expectant upon, you know, upon mighty miracles. But I believe that the, the essence and the crux of the message there is the greater works means that we are now able to go out to more and more people. So Jesus was only one person. Now, with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can be Jesus multiplied. So that's why I say the importance of us understanding that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the assignment. We have the great commission that Jesus gave to us to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Um, and that is the great commission. But he didn't just give us the commission. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us himself inside of us. So I believe the greater works means that we can now go out and we can reach greater nations we can reach all the nations out there and the countries out there and because we are now the body of christ with him as the head jesus can reach more and more people through through many of us as believers um amen i think it's important that that we know that 99 percent of the time god is going to flow through us so when people pray for a solution when they pray for god to answer their prayers and they have a need or they have a desire or they have a requirement something that that's on their heart that they need um, and they are desperate and they pray they cry out to God 99% of the time God is going to answer them through a person he's going to answer them through you and I so if it's for a for a financial blessing um, I believe God's going to place it on someone's heart to bless that person and to answer their prayer financially so the money will not fall from heaven although there has been there has been cases where where money does just materialize yes these things happen but most of the time god is going to place it on someone's heart to go and bless that person financially and be an answer to their prayers so we need to know that as people we are um, the body of christ and we are the people that god is going to use to answer prayers if people need a healing god's going to put it on our hearts to go and lay hands on that person um, for that healing to manifest um, if people need freedom, people are going to um, people are going to hear the truth that will set them free, and they will hear that truth when they hear the gospel that is preached by a person. We know Romans ten says, um, "How will they believe unless they hear? How will they hear unless there's a preacher? And how will we preach unless we are sent?" So God will God will send out preachers, and that is how the message will get out there. So even greater works, we are doing even greater works than Jesus because we are Jesus multiplied on the earth. We are many, many um, vessels that Jesus is now using to reach greater numbers out there. Um, I think that this, is, that this is awesome for us and this is something that is, I don't want to call it a responsibility, although it is 
but we actually get to partake of these things. So we get to partake as the body of Christ, we get to partake of the divine nature, we get to partake of the inheritance of the saints in the light, we get to cast out demons, we get to raise the dead, we get to, to heal the sick, we get to see and experience all these amazing miracles as we're obedient, as we follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit who, who now lives inside of us. Um, so yeah, I think that is, that's the essence of, of, of my message. I want to say one last thing in closing. Jesus said that we are the light of the world. He initially said that he is the light of the world. And then before he ascended, he said to his disciples, now you are the light of the world. And that's when he sent them out and he said, go. Um, so we are the light of the world. Just an interesting thing to, to end with is, maybe you know this or maybe you don't, but back in the days um, in Jerusalem at the temple, once a year um, with the Feast of Tabernacles, actually once a year, they would light these massive candelabras, um, which is like massive candlesticks, 75 meters tall. Um, and those those were so bright that they would actually light up the whole city. So th that that was done once a year, which meant the temple would actually shine bright and light up the whole city for a whole night once a year. Um, and it's interesting how that... Um, that's why when Jesus mentioned that we are the light of the world, or that they are the light of the world, that they would have understood that because they saw the temple light up once a year. Um, and we now, again, that was types and shadows, we are now that light of the world. So we get to shine bright. We are now a city set on a hill. The temple back in those days was set, Jerusalem was set up on a hill. We are now that that um, that city, that light of the world now. We get to shine bright. Um, so that the whole world can see. Let us be Jesus multiplied out there. I hope this message blesses you. Um, please feel free to share this. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so on the on the on the um, button below, and I will share a message again soon. Um, all the best to you and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye bye.